I will try to give a glimpse of next generation image formats. But before I start with the next generation, I want to talk a bit about the current generation. And let me get the clicker thing. So JPEG. What is JPEG? We already learned a lot about it in the previous talk. But JPEG is actually a committee, Joint Photographic Experts Group, which is basically you have the ISO and the IEC who have a joint technical committee, which has a subcommittee, which has a working group. And this working group is what we call JPEG because it's much easier to say than ISO, IEC, JTC1, SC29, Working Group 1. <laughs> um, but uh, the J in JPEG, it's not because it's part of the Joint Technical Committee. It's because it's actually also a joint initiative with the ITU. So all the JPEG standards are published as ISO, IEC standards and also as ITU standards. That, OK, developer art, like I said. Um, Anyway, JPEG is a great format. It was, uh, development started in the second part of the 80s, and it was eventually standardized in 1992, and it's still the image format on the web and everywhere else, basically. It features lossy compression with optional chroma subsampling. It uses a DCT, and it has these nice sequential and progressive options so you, like I explained in the previous talk, you can get previews of an image before you have downloaded the whole thing. So that's very nice. And the actual standard, if you read it, which I don't necessarily recommend doing, but it specifies an 8-bit and a 12-bit mode for lossy. It also specifies a lossless mode that can do up to 16-bit. It specifies that the format can handle four components, so theoretically it could do RGBA. This, the spec doesn't really specify what the components are, but... And there's two choices of entropy coding. Huffman, which is not patented, and arithmetic coding, which is currently not patented, but in 1992 it was. So, in 1992 people had to implement this thing and they were like, do I really need to implement all of this? It's, it's a lot of effort. Let's start with what we can really use right now. We don't need 12-bit because, I mean, 1992, we don't even have 8-bit displays, I mean, 24-bit displays. Um, so 8-bit is enough, Loss lossy is enough. We don't have memory for lossless or disk space, let's say. Um, and of course, we need to specify what the components are, but at that time, nobody was really thinking about it alpha transparency. So they basically said, if it's four components, then, well, then it's CMYK. Um, and in terms of entropy coding, they decided, well, we just implement Huffman because we don't have any patent issues, even though arithmetic coding could reach a bit better compression. So that's the de facto standard, and that's basically what people call JPEG nowadays. And even this restricted de facto standard is still quite good today. If you use a good JPEG encoder, like most JPEG, it's still performing quite well. But it has some limitations. So it can only do lossy, and in some cases you really need lossless. It's not very good at non-photographic images. So if you have illustrations, text, sharp edges, the DCT isn't really good at those things. It cannot do transparency, and it's limited to 8-bit. So currently with HDR, 10-bit displays, wide gamut, this is, this is starting to become more and more of a limit. So in these cases, we can use PNG or PNG. Um, PNG can handle up to 16-bit. It can do lossless. It can do alpha transparency. But, of course, it can only do lossless, so it has its own limitations. JPEG also cannot do animation. And like was mentioned in the previous talk, this is why we still have the GIF format. Other than animation, there is no reason to have the GIF format around. 
the entropy coding, so the compression density you can get with JPEG is no longer state of the art, which is hardly surprising after 30 years. And at lower bit rates, you get obvious comp compression artifacts. So the eight by eight blocks start to become visible. You get color bending, ringing, all the typical compression artifacts we associate with JPEG. So ever since the, let's say, second part of the 90s, people have been looking at alternatives to JPEG. And there have been many attempts to replace JPEG before. The JPEG committee itself has produced JPEG 2000, JPEG XR, JPEG XT. There have been various video codecs that have been turned into image formats, like WebP, which is based on VP8, like BPG and HEEC, which are based on HEFC, and more recently, the AVIF image format. But so far, none of these attempts have actually succeeded in replacing JPEG, at least not yet. And I could go in some details on the pros and cons of all of these formats, but I don't have time for that. So I will just skip these slides, let the camera film them so people can pause the slide <laughs> when they're watching this, but I'm not going to talk about this. I'll just give you a short summary. So basically, all of these formats have, obviously, they have advantages compared to JPEG. Otherwise, why would, why would you make it? But they also have disadvantages. So the I would say JPEG 2000, XR, and XT, they do improve upon JPEG in terms of compression, but the improvement is not huge. It's not compelling enough, I would say, to be the reason to switch. And to some extent, even WebP is kind of, it's not consistent enough. Like, on average, maybe it's better, but there's a significant enough tail of images where it's not really doing better or it's even doing worse. Um, the video-based codecs, they have the disadvantage that they don't have any progressive mode, which makes sense. In a video codec, why would you progressively render a single frame? It's not really a very useful feature in a video codec. But in an image format, it is. So these uh, formats only have a sequential mode, which is, I think, an important limitation of them. The WebP format also has limitations. It's only supporting chroma subsampling. So there's no option to disable the chroma subsampling. Uh, it can only do 8-bit. The more recent video-based formats, they tend to have a high complexity in terms of both computational complexity, so the encode time, decode time, and the implementation effort to, to, to implement these things is, is quite big. And in the case of HEEC or HFC, it's a patent mess. There's, there's so many patents related to this, and basically it's like what happened with GIF or GIF, but times, I don't know, 30,000. Um, so each of them still has some problems. And so we are in, in this situation. And this is an XKCD comic that is very important to me. Um, and I, it says, you know, character encodings, AC chargers, instant messaging, but actually this this thing was made for image formats because there are currently 14 competing image formats, right? <laughs> and we hopefully will soon have a situation where we have 15. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings me to JPEG Excel, the next generation JPEG format. So we have the JPEG committee, and about one year and a half ago, they uh, released a call for proposals 
to launch a new activity, a new image format. So they asked around in the image compression community, do you have proposals for how to do this thing? And in response to this CFP, seven proposals were submitted. So the JPEG committee decided, okay, looks like there is some interest in the community to do something. Let's start the JPEG Excel effort. So they started doing experiments with these proposals, subjective evaluations of compression versus uh, bitstream size versus uh, perceptual quality. And they looked at the proposals and they started eliminating some of the proposals, not really eliminating, but not considering them to be the starting point for JPEG Excel. And after these eliminations, there were basically two proposals left. So we decided to combine those two proposals and take that as a starting point for JPEG Excel. So proposal number three was a proposal by Google, the big image format. Proposal number six is a proposal by Cloudinary, the free universal image format. So we are combining these two approaches and this is the starting point for the JPEG Excel format. But we're both, both teams are still developing and finding out how to combine these things. So we hope that JPEG Excel will be better than just either of those individual uh, work in progress formats. So this is a, a short summary of how JPEG works. And it's, well, to me, it's rather simple because this is the uh, high level overview of how currently JPEG Excel looks like. And you don't have to be afraid. I will not make an attempt at <laughs> explaining all of this. Uh, there's no time for that. And in any way, this is a work in progress. So this slide is not necessarily what it's actually going to be. It's probably going to change still. But this is what we currently have in mind. So what are our goals in this effort? What are the features we want to have? What are the requirements? Um, the first one is something that is very important to both Cloudinary and, and the Google team that are involved. We want to create a royalty-free codec that has a free and open source implementation available right from the start. We think this is a crucial thing for an image codec to be successful. Obviously, we want to have all the features that people expect from a modern image codec. We need to support transparency. We need to and, and be able to encode depth channels uh, and other kinds of extra channels. We need to be able to handle high bit depth. We need to do lossless. We need to have state-of-the-art lossy compression as well. And we want to support some kind of animation so that we can at least get rid of GIF. Also, we want to have a progressive mode. And I will go into some more detail about this in a minute. We want to go further than just progressive. We want the format to be responsive by design. We want the format to be legacy friendly. And I will explain what this means. We want to have a focus on high quality, like perceptually lossless. So still lossy compression, but visually lossless. Should be possible. And we want something that can replace the existing formats that can handle all the use cases where you would currently use GIF or PNG, and of course, the use cases where you would currently use JPEG. So these last four require some more explanation, so I will go into those. First of all, responsive by design. What does this mean? So the internet has changed a lot 
in the past decades, in, in the time between the creation of JPEG and today. In the 90s, internet was slow for everybody, right? And screen resolution, screen sizes, they did, of course, vary, but not by much. You could basically assume that everybody was either using 800 by 600 or 1024 by 768, and a monitor was something like 14 inch, maybe 21 inch, but that was more or less the range. So it's a pretty uniform experience. Today, we have a very different situation. The bandwidth, uh, the latency, the connection speeds are varying a lot, even on the same device as you're moving around. The conditions vary a lot. The screen resolutions, the screen sizes, the physical dimensions, they vary a lot more than they used to. So building websites or building applications has to take this into account. And it's definitely no longer acceptable to make websites like this one that have this disclaimer at the bottom that this website is best viewed at some screen resolution. And if you don't have that screen resolution, please change your screen resolution to match our website design. That, that's definitely no longer acceptable. So responsive web design is important. We need to be able to build things that work for any viewport with. But this means that currently, we, ne we need to make a lot of variants for each image. We have the big original image, and then we downscale it to various dimensions to fit each of these viewport widths. And to take into account the fact that network conditions are not necessarily very reliable, we often use low quality image placeholders, which are very small representations, which could be done in various ways, maybe just a gradient or something, maybe a few pixels that are blurry. But we want to have something in a few hundred bytes that can give some sense that there is an image there. So we need all these variants. And the idea in JPEG Excel is to get rid of this approach and use a single file. one big file that contains the whole image, but if you need less than the whole image, just a smaller version of it, then you just download part of this one file. So if you need a low quality image placeholder, you just download the first 200 bytes. If you need a thumbnail, you download a bit more. If you need something that fills your cell phone screen, you download some more need something for a 4K display, probably download the whole thing. But a single file has many advantages in terms of delivery, CDN cache behavior, uh, the amount of markup that would be needed. So we think this is the way of the future if we can make this work. So how does the responsive by design work? It's basically based on a transform which I call squeeze, which is essentially downscaling the image and can either do it vertically or horizontally and storing the residuals needed to get back to the full resolution. And this step is applied recursively and the bitstream is organized in such a way that the downscale thing gets sent first, and then the extra information gets sent. It's pretty much similar to how a progressive JPEG works, except that you can actually get the lower resolution versions of the image at a much higher quality. So that's the responsive by design part. Now, legacy friendliness, this is something that needs to be explained. So whenever you make a new image format, the question is always, what do you do with your old images? And typically, the answer is you transcode them. So you 
use the decoder of the old format to get back to pixels, and then you encode these pixels with the new encoder. Problem with transcoding is it introduces generation loss. It introduces additional loss because you start with something lossy, you make it more lossy with a different lossy technique, so basically the artifacts accumulate. And there's no guarantee that the new file will actually be smaller than the old file, because if the old file is heavily compressed, low quality, but you don't really know that it is, then you might end up transcoding at too high a quality and getting something larger. So something like this can happen, where you have a, a crappy old JPEG that you convert to a WebP, but the WebP is larger than the JPEG. And it doesn't look any better, obviously. So in JPEG Excel, we pay a lot of attention to the transition from the old format to the new. So especially JPEG has a special meaning to us. So instead of requiring you to decode a JPEG file to pixels and then re-encode it, we have special transcoding modes where we can take an existing JPEG and re-encode it as a JPEG Excel without going to the pixel domain. So we basically directly encode the DCT coefficients of the JPEG, which means that it's an exact representation of what the JPEG contains. It's a lossless operation in the sense that, well, of course, you start with something lossy already, but you're not introducing additional loss. And we can guarantee that you will get something that is smaller than the original. It will never be larger. We can do the same thing, by the way, for palette images. So if you have a PNG 8 or a GIF, we don't need to go to 24-bit or 32-bit. We directly encode the indexed image. So this means that if you have this JPEG file, we can reduce the bitstream size substantially, but still have a reversible process where we can get back the original JPEG if needed. For instance, if we have to send something to a client that only has an existing JPEG decoder, it doesn't, hasn't upgraded yet to JPEG Excel. So this is a reversible process. There is no additional loss. The bitstream size will always be smaller. And we can even somewhat improve the quality of the result because we can apply more modern decoding techniques that legacy JPEG decoders don't have and render this information in a more advanced way and we can make it look like this. So I don't know if the projector allows you to see the difference. It's now flipping between the two. It's a, it's a bit subtle, but it should look, well, now no longer because it's flipped to the, yeah. Well, it's, it did look a bit better for a while. <laughs> Which brings me to the next point, focus on high quality. So one of the problems with the more recent image formats that are derived from video codecs is that video codecs tend to focus on low bit rates, which makes perfect sense because videos are a lot of pixels. You have a lot of frames. And you only see each individual frame for a fraction of a second. You don't have time to look at it and see the artifacts, unless it's an episode of Game of Thrones. And there's a lot of smoothing and distilling going on in video codecs, which is great for video. But for still images, it's not necessarily the best approach. So I'm not saying that video-derived formats cannot do high bitrate or high quality, but def it's definitely not the focus, especially lossless. It's not the focus of, of video codec developers. So we think that for still images, it has to be possible to bump up the quality enough to get visual lossless. So still, it's lossy compression, but we can pretty much guarantee that humans cannot tell the difference. So we use more advanced color spaces, the XYB color space, which is based on LMS. 
We use adaptive quantization guided by perceptual metrics in order to guarantee that each part of the image only gets as much compression as will not be detected by humans. So instead of using a single quality across the image, single quantization table in JPEG, we can have essentially different qualities in different regions of the image. And we have encoders that can automatically use the right quality in each region to ensure that you don't see the difference anywhere. So this obviously also has advantages for compression density because areas where you cannot see any difference can be encoded at a significantly lower quality without compromising the areas where you can tell the difference at, at that quality. Finally, JPEG Excel is intended to be a universal image format. There are many different kinds of images, and like the previous talk discussed, it's not just photographic images. There's also medical images, geographical images, comics, illustrations, screenshots, game graphics, computer rendered graphics, all kinds of stuff. And what we want to have is an image format that can handle each of these things. This is why I called my proposal the universal image format, which is a bit ambitious, I admit. But the idea is that it can handle any kind of image content. So you don't have to let the end user decide which format to pick for a particular image. You can just use the same format, and it works well for all these different types of content. So in that sense, JPEG Excel is intended to be a universal image codec, a future-proof image codec that can handle extra channels, even ones that we may not necessarily anticipate right now. No arbitrary limits on things like bit depth or image dimensions, and also universal in the sense that it can handle anything from low bitrate to lossless and reach a state-of-the-art compression across the spectrum. And finally, also universal in the sense that we can make different trade-offs different trade in the same image format between the uh, compression density and the encode and decode speed. Just uh, to give you an idea, this is, of course, preliminary results, but this is just for lossless. Uh, lossless is easy to com compare because you just compare sizes of the bitstream. In lossy comparisons, everything is a bit trickier to compare. So in, in lossless, if you look at non-photographic images, PNG is doing quite well. Of course, uh, JPEG is not here because JPEG cannot do lossless, but JPEG 2000 is considered to be uh, a good lossless codec for photographic images. For non-photographic images, as you can see, it's not doing so well. So it's 1.5 times as large as the PNG. Lossless WebP, WebP has a lossless mode, is doing quite well for non-photographic images. It's significantly improving upon PNG. And JPEG Excel is also doing well, so it's shaving off a bit more than WebP. For photographic images, PNG is not that good. JPEG 2000 is doing better. Um, WebP is doing as good as JPEG 2000. JPEG Excel can trim off a bit more. And if you look at higher bit depth, 12-bit photos, for instance, PNG is not good at 12-bit, basically because it forces the representation to be 16-bit. JPEG 2000 is quite good at photographic images, also at 12-bit or 16-bit. 
And JPEG Excel is still slightly better than JPEG 2000. WebP cannot handle anything above 8 bits, so there's no data. So basically, in all of these corpuses, JPEG Excel is doing better than the current state of the art. So in that sense, it's universal. It can handle both non-photographic and photographic. So to conclude, JPEG 2000 is responsive by design, legacy friendly, focuses on high quality, and it's a universal image format.